I'm 5'1". Used to be 5'8". It's called aging. Uh, I just want to say that Amanda told me that she's not feeling very loved tonight. And what could be more loving than to give a home to writers? She's the antidote to Amazon. So let's give Amanda up. <clears throat> it's the job of a journalist to expose or explore the truth or the lie uh, hidden beneath the slick surface of a politician's public persona. Uh, but that often takes daring. So let's say it's April 1968. Uh, there's a launch party at the Four Seasons given for the beginning of New York Magazine. Well, I can't go. I, my world is the Lower East Side. Uh, I'm a single mom in a fourth floor walk-up. Well, at late at night, a long black limo creeps into East 7th Street, and a man in black tie steps out. And I'm thinking, what? On East 7th Street, we don't have black limos. What we have is hippies and uh, Ukrainian refugees. My lookout on the first floor calls up in the intercom. She says, a fancy man wants coming up. Is it OK? I said, OK. So, in barges this man in black tie is Clay Felker, the founder of New York Magazine. I'm stunned. He's looking around. He's looking for potheads and other creepy Lower East Side animals. And he says, why weren't you at the party tonight? I said, well, I mean, I don't have a gown and I couldn't afford a babysitter. What do you know about politics? Well, I mean, my father's a country club Republican. My mother's a born, born, natural born, bomb throwing Irish rebel. So I know about politics. It's about arguing at the dinner table. Then you'll understand Bobby. Bobby who? Bobby Kennedy. I want you to go out and cover his campaign in California and Oregon. He's running against Gene McCarthy. Me? I, I've never written a political story. Now's the time to start. You know, you've got to get out there and do a big story. You can do as many little stories as you want, and they may be terrific, but they're not going to start a new conversation. What you have to do is, is grab something that everybody's talking about, but they don't know the why. Well, I took the dare. I swallowed my fear. I asked my sister to stay with my daughter, and I went out on the campaign. Well, here's Bobby Kennedy. One day, he's, oh, I see him at every stop in rural Oregon. He's met by a hostile, gun-toting crowd seething at him. They seem to have, they have possums and muskrats and God knows what on their shoulders. They're the scariest looking crowd you ever saw. And Kennedy just gets right up there and starts talking about limiting the spread of guns. Whew. Whoa, what a popular subject in those territory. Well, this goes on, this goes on. And one day, he's in a particularly rough place, Roseburg, Oregon. A young man taps him on the shoulder as he's walking up, take the platform. He says, I've been waiting here for two hours to tell you I'm going to shoot somebody before I see anybody like you, a Nazi like you in the White House. Kennedy just ignores him, walks right up on the courthouse steps, and stands there in front of everybody unprotected and says, let's have a discussion about limiting the spread of guns. And he actually gets a discussion going. That's courage. I saw it in the flesh. We get back on the plane. The seat beside him is empty. All of a sudden, I hear, you want to sit up here in New York? New York? That's me. He's actually asking me to sit next to him. So I do, and we have a conversation. There's freckles at our feet. And he asks a, an aide to hand him our JFK's overcoat. His brother has been assassinated five years ago. But Bobby Kennedy is still wearing John Kennedy's clothes. It's such a poignant moment. And we talk about that and how he faces fear and death. As we're approaching Portland, Oregon, rain smears the window. You can't see a damn thing. And we don't see that there's a plane heading straight towards us. Well, all of a sudden, you know, men are screaming. My, my tummy turns over. Our craft is dropping like a stone. And in the middle of the drop, RFK says, I knew Gene McCarthy was desperate. I didn't know he was that desperate. 
That gave me an insight into Bobby Kennedy's truth. He had seen so much death in his life that he was a total fatalist. He knew he was a target, and that's why he just kept walking into those crowds and spreading that message. And two nights later, his own life was ended by a gun. <clears throat> two decades later, I went to Great Britain to write about Margaret Thatcher. She was in her 10th year, the top of her game, but she looked 20 years younger than when she entered office. What was the secret of her rejuvenation? I had to find out. I even subjected myself to an electrical bath. We'll get to that in a minute. Okay. She was in her 60s, but she was suddenly gone with the fussy pussycat blows and the, you know, these dowdy suits. And she was dressing in a whole different way. As a matter of fact, when I first saw her uh, at question time, she walked in very deferentially. She had a tuxedo jacket on. She walked in, and then she turned with her back to her front benchers, and she always wore very uh, slinky black stockings, and she just would rub one leg with the other for the delectation of her back benchers. Well, that was a clue. She had become a, a shameless flirt in her 60s. She had, she surrounded herself with star boys. They all looked like 1930s American matinee idols. Silver hair, Ronald Coleman. Uh, <clears throat> and she would, you know, make, I mean, she would go to the airport to meet her ambassador to the US with her Daimler limousine, push the seats back into total recline, and just nuzzle up thigh to thigh. He said, you know, it was, it was a rather hardening experience. Some of her star boys told me that I find Mrs. T, T sexually attractive in a rather packaged way. <laughs> well, all right, I had to find out the secret. I discovered she had an imperious Indian woman who called herself Madame Veronique. And her salon was extremely exclusive. Only very aristocratic ladies frequented it and you had to be introduced. So <clears throat> I took on a false persona. I got into the inner sanctum, and she it, uh, you know, directed me to strip, climb up the stool to the edge of her vast bath. She was standing at the other end of it, manipulating the amps. And I'm standing there, buck naked, shivering with fear, saying, I've done a lot of things to get a story, but I draw the line at electrocution. Madame Veronique, <clears throat> my dear, I have had kings and princes and little bitty emirs in that tub. Step in. Well, I stepped in. She shakes the garlic salts and other th things, and I allow myself to be parboiled for an hour. But I am hearing about the romantic attraction between Margaret Thatcher and Mikhail Gorbachev. Imagine. Okay. So the story is that <clears throat> Mrs. Thatcher, well before Gorbachev was made president, picked him out of the hat as the likely next Soviet leader. He was just a provincial party boss. She brings him to London. <clears throat> she takes him to Checkers. They sit up half the night, lots of brandy, don't even touch their food. And as she told me, I found it very delightful to act, to debate uh, with Mr. Gorbachev in a very animated way. Uh, and they did this over and over. Well, then she announces to the world, I like Mr. Gorbachev. We can do business together. That put him on the map. The next time they come together, he says, well, you know, Maggie, uh, we're really European in Russia. She said, oh, nonsense. You'll never be accepted by Europe until you lift the Iron Curtain. It's archaic. Well, he then actually asked her to explain how the British Commonwealth let go of its colonies and still maintained its position as a world power. He took notes. Thatcher knew she had her hooks into him. Now she went to her other heartthrob, 
Ronnie, as she called him, the president, and told him that Gorbachev could be persuaded to unyoke his East European satellites peacefully. And that was when Ronald Reagan was able to say to the world, Mr. Gorbachev, tear down that wall. It was Thatcher who was the, actually the catalyst between the men who ran the two world superpowers. And the result of that was the end of the Cold War. As Margaret Thatcher would say to me repeatedly, the female of the species is deadlier than the male. <laughs> and oh, a final note, my story was debated in the House of Commons. Mrs. Thatcher's electrical bass earned her a new sobriquet, the Iron Lady. <laughs> Thank you.